Thank you very much, Dr. Paskett. We're very fortunate to have Dr. Neil Palafox here with us today. He's our next speaker and is currently the Professor of Family Medicine and Community Health at the John A. Burns School of Medicine and Professor of Cancer Prevention and Control at the University of Hawaii Cancer Center. He spent nearly a decade working in the Marshall Islands as a physician and medical director of a U.S.-funded program to care for radiation-affected people and was actually the PI of a congressionally mandated program to provide medical care for Marshall Islanders who were exposed to fallout from the Bravo hydrogen bomb detonation. He also spent the majority of his career focused on reducing health disparities in populations in Hawaii and the U.S.-affiliated Pacific Islands. Please welcome Dr. Palafox. Uh, thank you very much. I'm certainly honored to be here to uh, speak about the Pacific and from Hawaii. Aloha mai kako, yakwe komale from the Marshall Islands. So I will be talking about the U.S. affiliated Pacific and this young woman in uh, the right hand side is from the Federation of Micronesia and Yap. So you have some faces to link with. So uh, the outline of my talk, I'll be talking about the U.S. affiliated Pacific Island jurisdictions. And I'll be talking about the social culture determinants of population health, which ap applies to cancer control. And in order to understand this, we really have to talk a little bit about history, economic, and global re relationships. And in many conferences like this, I'm going to touch on two topics that people usually don't like to talk about. And I'm going to go there. It's about indigeneity, cultural trauma, and colonization. But they're very important for cancer control in, in these areas. And then I'll speak about an operational framework taking these things and that taking these issues into account and uh, the principles and process and structures we use that uh, you know, have uh, thought through some of these things that um, are so social cultural determinants. And finally, there'll be a set of recommendations that um, we will use from the work that um, we've done in the Pacific. So US Associated Pacific Islands, what are they? And where are they? So there's three flag territories and a commonwealth. So, Guam and American Samoa are the territories. And everybody knows about American Samoa because they're overrepresented in the NFL. And, <laughs> and the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas is you know, a commonwealth, much like Puerto Rico, except it's in the Pacific. The freely associated states were former territories in the Pacific that are freely associated with the United States. They are linked to the United States by a compact of free association. And the 10 second version of the compact of free association is that uh, the United States has complete military oversight of these areas, and the quid pro quo is that they can migrate and work in the United States without a green card or visa. And they give them so, uh, the United States provides some uh, operational monies as well. So this is a picture of where I work. And uh, uh, so the center where the target is, is that's the Republic of the Marshall Islands. That oval to the left is the Federal States of Micronesia. The, Vertical oval to the your, your top left is a uh, Commonwealth Northern Marianas. Below that, that little circle is Guam, and the far oval, vertical oval to the left of that is Palau, and then American Samoa is the most um, southern part. And this is the U.S. Associated Pacific, where uh, we we work, and so re low resource settings. And so a lot of people say, "Well, that's U.S. territories. They're not lo low resource settings." But the question always is, and this is again from whose perspective, and so at, as a low resource set, setting, certainly um, relative to industrialized nations and global economies. And these areas all have a difficult time to compete. And they're very economically dependent on you know, uh, the United States. So, and also one of the things that makes them low resource per se is that the populations are small. So Fiji has 900,000 people. And the biggest one is uh, Papua New Guinea. Some of you might know about Papua New Guinea. It has about 7 million people. But in the, in the Pacific arena, there's Fiji's 900,000. Koshrai, one of the places I work, has only 8,000 people. Marshall Islands has 55,000. And there's countries like Tokelau, which has 2,000 people. Now, there's two perspectives you can have on this. One is that they're small, they're so small, whatever, or the other perspective is there a very special population that can disappear in a couple of generations unless we help them go on. 
And so depending on where you stand with that and how important the size of the population is will make a difference in your lens of how you work with these people. They're geographically isolated in small land mass. So the Marshall Islands where the target is, just the target is 772,000 square miles of ocean and only 70 square miles of land. 70 square miles of land, Hawaii's square miles of land is 36, Hawaii. So this is 70. And 70, 772,000 square miles of ocean is Texas, California, Minnesota, Utah, Arizona pushed together. So you have 55,000 people scattered over this area, which makes the logistics extremely difficult. And so when Mona Soraya says cancer registry in a certain place might cost $60 per person, we have a cancer registry, and it's not $60 per person. And you can see some of the reasons why. So as far as you know, uh, low resource, the bottom line is the US um, per capita total expenditure in health per year. This is in purchasing power parity. And the other small bars you see are the US Associated Pacific. And so you want to talk about disparities and what's, what actually is contributed out there. And you can see that Chuk is $140 per person per year versus 8,000. So again, just a demonstration of this. What is a cancer burden in the Pacific? Hepatitis B is 15 to 18% carrier rates. Liver cancer is very high. And Commonwealth of Northern Mariana's highest adolescent smoking rates in the United, entire United States. Cervical cancer incidence is the highest worldwide. As you know, in the Pacific, many of you may or may not know, obesity prevalence is the highest in the world, in the world. And obesity drives 10 different types of cancer, as you know, at least 10 that, I, that I'm aware of. And there was a US nuclear weapons testing that the, the US did in the Pacific, which also generates cancer. And the infrastructure, many of you talked about this, in these kinds of settings is not there to take care of these issues. So the first issue I wanted to talk about, one of the first issues is, indigeneity or indigenous peoples. And what is an indigenous person? An indigenous person is a, a person whose ancestors lived in an area before settlement or formation of modern state borders. But what that means is somebody colonized them and set that border and said that this is ours, we discovered you. And so the history of colonization in the Pacific went through Spain, Germany, Britain, France, Japan, and the United States. These areas were all colonized by the United States. And so Currently, the current definition of indigeneity is used to identify collectives with particular rights in national and international courts. And why is that? It's because colonization has provided a lot of uh, difficulties with who has rights for what in their own lands. So this is a person, a picture of a person from uh, Chamorro from the Commonwealth of Northern Morianas, the one with a peace sign, and the other one is from the of uh, Pohn Pei and the Federal States of Micronesia, the two women that I work with a lot. And so the implications of colonization, it creates classes of people. The indigenous are often the disadvantaged in their own land. And even sometimes they're the, they're the, the numerical majority. And what the colonizers usually do is they change the land rights and how, it, how the economy has changed. So, at, uh, the land used to belong to the collective in the Pacific over time versus individual ownership of land. So as a collective over time, nobody owned the land. And when you do this, because the land was a foundation of culture, this is a social and cultural effects. The foundation of culture was land. It meant the food, the nutrition, the lineage, who you were, health. And in fact, most Pacific Islanders believe that the land generates the spirit, spirit of health. So when you change that, your spirit of health and, and your spirituality dies. And so colonization is a big deal. And land rights now, of course, uh, with indigeneity, they're arguing in national courts, who has a moral ownership of land? And there's lots of fights about this. So implications of colonization. One of the things that we do with uh, a lot of the programs you have, every single one I've heard about, it's about motivating people to do certain things in particular ways. Colonization is about motivating people, but it's about normalization and denormalization of behaviors. The identity is removed and changed. So the question is, with a lot of programs that we have, are we doing that? 
And do we recognize at what level we may or may not be doing that? And also with colonization, it's odd, but all the diseases and illnesses that are brought into the Pacific are associated with the colonizer. And, and then we're giving them systems to change like we're doing from problems that we've caused. And so it's an odd dynamic, but it's a, perhaps a necessary di dynamic, but it's something that goes on in the background of indigenous peoples. And then what's, we also talked about this, um, but it turns out that in many of these areas and in the areas I, that I work with is though we give them these opportunity, the standards of health are never equal or uh, accessible in equal amounts from, from the people who are the colonizers and the people who have been colonized. So that there is that, we will give you this and help you this, but it's never equal standards and it's never equal access. So colonization, uh, health promotion, which includes cancer prevention and control, therefore becomes linked, another un, un favorite topic of many science institutions, is it has to be linked to social justice. It has to be about equity of access and resources, and many of you talked about that. And it must be linked to equity of health outcomes, and health has to be achieved through social determination, as opposed to we're gonna give you these programs, we're gonna give you lots of money, a very different model of looking at this. Another issue is that I want to speak to is cultural trauma. What is cultural trauma? So sometimes in the history of a peoples, there is an, an event that takes place that is traumatic to, that's a traumatic event. It can happen over time. And through this event, the collective forms a memory about this, and that becomes part of their identity of who they are. They do not have to be pr uh, present at the time, but it can run through their children and their children's children. The examples of this that have been written about many times are slavery and black American identity. It's about the illegal annexation of Hawaiian, native Hawaiian identity. And many of you may or not, may not know, but in international law and in United States law, Hawaii was actually illegally annexed. And they're trying to figure out what to do with that. But anyway, and then colonization of the Pacific. There's other things that have caused tremendous cultural trauma. So the United States, so in the Pacific, everybody that's a colonizer wants to do their nuclear testing in the Pacific. So France did it in French Polynesia. Britain did it in the Aboriginal deserts of Australia. And the United States did it in the Marshall Islands. And the nuclear legacy, um, as you can see, was a part of the nuclear traumatic issue. So we set off uh, 67 nuclear detonations which was equivalent in megatonnes to 7,200 Hiroshima bombs. It was done above ground. It was done in the homes of people. So we moved people. We didn't do it in, in places that were not inhabited. We moved people from their homes. And so, you know, and this stuff causes cancer. And a lot of what you were talking about, the difficulty of explaining cervical cancer to people, try explaining ionizing radiation to people. It is a very difficult thing to do, and, uh, and I've worked with this for a long time. The other thing that represents an issue of cultural trauma because it's, uh, it's um, formed in a certain way, it's uh, we have issues about uh, sea level change and heating. And so you know where the most effective places are? It's the Pacific. We're already they're flooding their taro patches with salt water that can't grow. In the Marshall Islands, their atolls, the highest point above sea level, the average above sea level is six feet, six feet. So you change a whole ecology if the ocean rises one foot. And so the, the developed nations, when they you know, do what they do and cause this, that is a traumatic event. And so already you can see cultural trauma being formed by not only nuclear testing and colonization, but the whole, you know, uh, Climate change issue is a, is a tremendous, has a tremendous effect of uh, lack of water and so forth. And cultural trauma transmits through generations. It affects relationships. And we all talked about, especially the, the last previous two speakers, is you have to have trust. You have to trust you what you're doing. So here I'm, I'm a scientist. Do they, do they trust me? So all the trust through what you have seen has been violated. At every stage of the game has been violated. The collective identity has strengthened and been strengthened and formed by things that perhaps may have been negative. And the identity of the per 
perpetrator is part of that collective identity. So, and it is difficult to wash these things out over time. And again, I know very little about this, but I'm using it as an example. This is not my forte, but slavery. That doesn't wash out over time. These kinds of things don't wash out over time. It takes a long time to kind of get these things to work. So what is the framework that we use, taking all of this into context for cancer control? Um, and so I will be talking about the principles that we use, the processes that we use, and the structures that we use to kind of adapt to the, the notions that I've uh, spoke about. So one of the principles is understanding indigeneity, understanding cultural trauma, and more so understanding the cultural assets of the people. Most of the time when we speak about people who are indigenous, we talk about their culture deficits. People always talk about people you know, in disparity with the culture, de their deficits, but it's rearranging that and talking about their cultural assets. It's protecting indigenous health, so it has to be indigenous people-centered. So it's about celebrating who they are, not the science that I bring in or the institution I bring in. It's about how do I bring out their indigeneity, and it's indigeneity-centered, and it's to promote their self-efficacy about it, and not my ability to do science or give the latest whatever. It's really, it has to be part of them uh, being, you know, their self-efficacy. There has to be a component of so, um, social justice, which I talked about, and about development. The processes is building trust and relationships, and the previous speaker talked about this. Uh, you know, I've, I worked in the Marsh Lions since 1983, and so this has been built over time and relationships. Uh, there's, uh, we have to work, and many of you know about this, participatory community engagement. And participatory means that actually it is participatory and they have equal power, equal power. In fact, I would go as far to say as they have, they should be able to trump you at any time. And development means you do your work to build capacity. You have to work within the cultural framework and always realizing cancer control is performed in a cultural context. It's performed always, any disease prevention is per performed in a cultural context. And so understand all these things and how that you know, is, uh, af is affected their uh, cultural look at what we're trying to help them with. Structure, so the structure in order to adjust to this is we have built local cancer co coalitions, there's community and institutional stakeholders, and each of these co uh, coalitions actually builds their own plan and implements their plan. Uh, you know, so to, to then celebrate who they are. Then we've also regionalized the area so that through an economy of scale, we've looked at the region and said, because they are small countries and small areas, what can we do that they cannot do because they are so small? And so we've regionalized, and there's a regional plan around this. So this is the uh, first, you know, regional effort that we have, and I don't know if any of you recognize this gentleman in the middle. This is Dr. Dr. Harold Freeman. But actually, he was the one who understood in 2001, actually, the dilemma we were in. And he, from the NCI, provided first money for us to be able to regionalize. And so, you know, again, it's a partnership in looking at uh, folks. But he then became, you know, one of the champions of this effort. And how do we do this? So this is schematic. So each one of these areas um, Palau, RMI, Guam, CNMI, American Samoa, each one of them has their own cancer coalition. Each one of the circles in blue has their own uh, cancer plan that the indigenous folks have developed over time. They have regionalized and have formed the Cancer Council of the Pacific Islands, which is above. So that is the kind of how things are structured regionally, So, it, but it centers on every single jurisdiction has its own plan and coalition that builds that plan. And then, you know, they, we have the partners that are in the boxes on the outside, which are many of the people in this room. And so certainly I've worked with Phil Castle and Mona Soraya and, you know, Tasha from Sea Change and other folks, many, many folks in this, and, you know, Dr. Ted Trimble. And so what has worked? Regionalization, uh, regionalization has worked. So in this model, so the good news is that we've, we've changed tobacco policies, we've changed the standards for breast and cervical cancer in the region, we've 
introduce resource-appropriate health technology, uh, and uh, Mona talked a little bit about that. We have worked a lot on human resource development. We have put in a cancer registry, which was never there before, that was uh, CDC funded. We have active research in beetle nut and cervical cancer. Uh, we have linked with the other existing collaboratives in NCD and tobacco, and there's a lot of capacity building around this. So this is what has happened through understanding the dynamic of the past. And so you saw the small picture with Dr. Freeman. This is a picture of 2009. This is a picture of 2015 on the people from the Pacific who work on this from all the different areas. And so the recommendations, successful cancer prevention control in the U.S. Pacific Islands, you must have a, one that must have a, fu a foundational knowledge of the history and the colonization. And, and true understanding of what indigeneity and cultural trauma is about, and more than anything, one must know their own bias. In order to some, understand someone else's culture, they always say, you gotta know your own culture, and you gotta know what lens. And this is why these kind of topics upset so many people, because there's a, there's a frame, a lens they have which might differ. Uh, cultural trauma moves through generations and is an identity collective. We must build trust, collective, and maintain relationship. And the plan must move towards social justice, that is, health equity. So finally, uh, this is uh, uh, from a uh, Native Hawaiian woman who wrote this. And she wrote this about research, but it's really about all the work that we do. And it captures the summary in my mind. Above all else, indigenous research or health uh, care models should be about healing and empowerment. It should involve the return of dignity and the restor restoration of sovereignty. And it should ultimately bring formerly colonized communities one step further along the path of self-determination. We, sh we, should, we should think on these factors as they apply to our own research or interventions. And if and when we decide to proceed, we should do humbly and in an effort to serve. And so this is a uh, picture from Yap State and where they carry heavy loads together in partnership. And thank you very much from all the different parts of the country. Thank you.